away after reading everything, and I thought, you know, this wasn't a job for him. This really wasn't even a career for him. To me, it would have been a calling from God for him to have done what he has accomplished in his life. So as general, retired Army General B.B. Bell, four-star general, comes forward, we have something else. This is a little video that we were sent the other day, and we were just really thrilled with it. And I sent it to Carla, and she said, let's go ahead and show this. And as Jason is getting it ready, let me just tell you, this is a group of high school students from Kentucky. They're in a competition. And this is how they end their evening every night before they go to bed. I think that's the end of my presentation right there. <laughs> Are you kidding me? What else could I say? Can you all hear me all right? I, I have a kind of a, a loud voice, probably because I'm half deaf. And um, I don't mean to blow you out of here by any stretch. Uh, Carla, terrific. Thank you for making this a great day. And Marilyn, thank you for inviting me. And where did David go? Is David still here? David's over there. Those jokes... Well, one, it took away about half my pitch, which is good. I don't have to tell any jokes now. <laughs> they were terrific. Thank you, sir. I do have one small thing to add, however. When Katie and I arrived here a little while ago, uh, I jumped out of the car to go around and, and uh, you know, help her with the door or whatever. And, and when I got around the side, she was getting out, and she screamed. I thought she was falling. I mean, did you all hear? Did you hear? It was unbelievable. And so, I, Katie, you know, hospital, what are you okay? She said, you wore a brown belt. <laughs> yeah. What, what's wrong with the brown belt? Oh, we have to go home. <laughs> Sweetheart, we can't go home. We, we're here. We live in Ottawa. We have, to, we have to go somewhere and get a black belt. 
Well, actually, if anyone wants to know the brown belt story, it's just a brown belt, and I don't see anything wrong with it. And so, Katie, get over it, baby. <laughs> that's, that's it. It's going to be bad, I'll tell you. It's going to be bad. Uh, look, uh, as a lead-in to my presentation today, and I'll try to blow through this so that uh, you all can get to the important stuff, and that's eating. H have you all noticed that ISIS was defeated? It's, not, it's no longer a problem. And Carla, you mentioned terrorism and all that, but it's gone. There is no more terrorism. It's terrific. Gone. Now, the reason I say that is because when you watch the news now, it's never on the news anymore. There's nothing on the news anymore except the U.S. presidential primaries. Nothing. And so I'm figuring that if we can't get through this primary season quick, that I'm going to either have to move to Australia or do something because it's driving me nuts. But one thing is for sure, if you believe that uh, things are really tough in the world. Don't necessarily believe it because the next day our news will have something else that's really important. Do you know that our presidential election is not for eight more months? Can you imagine putting up with this for eight more months? God, why, why can't we just have an election next Thursday and be done with it? It's crazy. At, at any rate, the only thing I, I have seen lately that preempted the presidential primary stuff was Peyton Manning's retirement. Now, that was okay. I thought, well, that's pretty good. You know, maybe we're making progress. Maybe they'll say something about ISIS, but they didn't. They went right back to, you know, to Donald Trump and everybody else that they're talking about. Okay. Um, look, let me uh, move you all out of this room for just a little while. Way west. I mean, way west. So far west that it's actually east, okay? In uh, Jason, if you'll throw that first chart up, I'll, I'll uh, chat with you all about it here in just a second. I don't know if it's going to... Yeah, there it is. Just leave it there for a minute. This is one of the most troubled regions of the world. It's called Northeast Asia. It's the area of North and South Korea. And by the way, my final assignment in the military was as the commander of South Korean and U.S. forces in Korea with the mission of deterring North Korea aggression or if that should fail to conduct a war with North Korea and end it quickly on our terms. Uh, uh, Japan's in the area, China and indeed Russia are in the area, and I'll talk about that in a second. And so um, one of the questions that you often hear when it does pop through on the news, and it does every now and then, is why in the world do we now care about that area? Why is it seemingly always our problem, these places overseas? Why don't we just leave that area alone for Japan and South Korea to take care of themselves? After all, they're big boys now. They're very modern, and they can just handle it themselves. And many, of course, say that China, who's in the neighborhood, the big brother in that area for sure, is fleecing us every day with economic manipulation and really bad deals. Have you heard about bad deals from China lately? And I suppose that may very well be the truth, to be honest with you. And perhaps we are indeed stupid about some of those trade deals. Um, and, and so I, I won't get into that. But I will say that we've had troops in that area, in Japan and South Korea, since the end of World War II and since the end of the Korean War. And many would ask, you know, good grief, aren't they ever going to be able to take care of themselves? This is crazy. Enough is enough, right? World War II ended 71 years ago. It ended 71 years ago. And the Korean War ceasefire was 63 years ago, a long time ago. And it's costing us a fortune to keep troops in Korea stationed over there in that area. And they, the Koreans, and indeed the Japanese, where we also have troops, don't pay us a dime for all of our trouble. They're just fleecing us, many would say. Bring home our troops, save the money, and let's take care of ourselves here at home. That's what I hear a lot of. The problem will just go away, like ISIS. Won't be on the news, nobody will care. If we didn't have troops over there, Kim Jong-un could do whatever he wanted to do, and we wouldn't care. Like ISIS, they would just go away. But I, today, of course, want to give you a little bit different perspective of that neighborhood. You might be amazed at what I share with you. You might not, but you might. 
Tom Lowe won't be amazed, I'm certain. Tom's still here. Tom, I don't, yeah, there he is. Up front, I'd offer today that South Korea is actually, so I'll tell you the bottom line first and I'll prove it to you, the center of gravity for peace, security, and economic stability in all of that area, little old teeny South Korea. And I'll get into that in a second. And the center of gravity is really good for us, America, here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and all over our great country. It's good for us. It makes us more prosperous, and it makes us a much more stable and makes us a more secure country, which is hard to believe, but it's true. And here's why. First, let me give you an overview. This is South Korea, little old teeny place. This is China, goes on forever, big country. There's Beijing, their capital. That's Russia, right there, Russia. They are a huge country, obviously. Go from Western Euro or Eastern Europe all the way uh, to the uh, East Asian area. So this is Russia, and they share a border right there with North Korea. So China, big border with North Korea. Russia, a little short border with North Korea. And of course, here's Japan. Notice there's Tokyo, here's Seoul, here's Beijing. Seoul is significantly closer to Beijing than it is to Tokyo. And that will come into play in a second as I carry through a few more of these uh, perspectives I'd like to tell you about that area of the world. All of these nations, I might add, all of those, have a historically friction-filled relationship amongst themselves, lots of wars, with South Korea specifically, who they fight over all the time, and with us, the United States of America. Brutal wars have been common in that area of the world up till 63 years ago when the Korean War ended. But in that very tough neighborhood, today, South Korea, this teeny little place right here, is and right dead in the middle of this mess called Northeast Asia, is a beacon of stability. It's a superbly functioning free market economy and it is an electoral democracy. Democracy in the world is a little rare this day and age, it seems. Corporate giants, such as Samsung. Hello, Samsung, my phone. It's off right now. I'm okay, Katie. My phone is off. Corporate giants like Samsung, Hyundai Automobiles, Hyundai Shipbuilding, the second largest shipbuilder on the planet and used to be the largest. LG Electronics. There's not a single hotel room in America that didn't have an LG TV hanging on the wall. And you may very well own an LG washing machine or something like that. But LG Electronics, Kia Automobiles, Posco Steel, the third largest steel maker on the planet. Can you imagine that? Much larger than the United States. All these South Korean companies and many more are leading global enterprises in their economic segments. And there are many more companies in South Korea that I won't bother you with today. They model their economic free market corporations after those in the United States. They went to school on us. They are superb capitalists. We talk about Americans being capitalists. Believe me, the South Koreans are superb capitalists. They are our sixth largest trading partner on this planet, generating well over $100 billion of trade with the United States annually and South Korea, with its population of just over 51 million people in that little place, is about the size of our state of Indiana. If you can imagine that being Indiana sitting there. Half of which, half of which South Korea in this case, is uninhabitable due to large mountains. It's a very mountainous country. Nonetheless, South Korea has the 12th largest economy in the world. Larger than the economies of Israel, yes, larger than Mexico, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, and Sweden, to name just a few of the 195 economies in the world that are measured by people that measure those things. 12th largest. South Korea's gross domestic product, their GDP, is significantly larger than that of the United States of America. Their standard of living has been measured as about the same as that of France. And we know the French, they got a great standard of living. They sit around, drink wine, and don't do anything, right? Who's from France? I'm sorry I made you mad. <laughs> but that's South Korea today. Can you imagine half of Indiana today, half of Indiana because of these mountains, being the 12th largest economy in the world? Well, little old South Korea is. 
And there's more to this picture. South Korea champions a world-class educational system for their kids, K through 12, and at the university level also. One could argue that their public education uh, system is one that they improved on and learned from the United States of America. We helped them put together their K through 12 system and university system following the Korean War. South Koreans embrace individual freedom and they have a strong family value system. They are entrepreneurs of the highest order. They have a stunning work ethic and their moral code is hinged on a strong spiritual base, both Christian and Buddhism. Indeed, South Korea is one of the strongest missionary countries today on the globe with over 23,000 Korean missionaries abroad today, making South Korea the second or third largest missionary sending country, depending on the way you measure it, on this planet. And it wasn't so many years ago that we were sending missionaries to Korea. Some of you remember that. Not anymore. 23,000 Koreans are spreading the gospel on this planet on all Christianity's behalf. South Korea is an enormously reliable American friend and American military ally, something a bit rare in this day and age, as you might have noticed, with respect to reliable allies and military partners. Now, while we do have a mutual security treaty with South Korea, it only obligates them to fight with us right there, to fight with us in Northeast Asia, specifically against North Korea. But, interestingly, the South Koreans have fought with us voluntarily outside treaty paradigms in Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, and Afghanistan. They've been on our side voluntarily. Indeed, in Vietnam, they provided 50,000 ground troops and suffered 5,000 soldiers killed in action and 11,000 wounded, all voluntarily standing by our side. Today, at our request and also in support of United Nations peacekeeping missions around the world, South Korea has troops and their military operating in 13 foreign countries, foreign to them, including Afghanistan, Somalia, South Sudan, the United Arab Emirates, Haiti, Liberia, and the Philippines, to name the front end of those. The South Koreans were with us in Iraq before we precipitously withdrew our troops in December 2011. That's when South Korea left also. Where we go, they go. Where we leave, they leave. The bottom line is that South Korea is a close and reliable military ally of the United States. Historically, when we ask for their help, they stand and deliver. Only Great Britain, among all of our so-called close military allies, has such a record of military support and assistance to the United States of America. Only Great Britain. South Korea is surely not your daddy's Oldsmobile anymore. Indeed, your car was quite possibly made in South Korea. Those old pictures of MASH and Korean War Quonset huts on television are just that, old. Now, with all this, there is for sure an enormous security and instability problem in Northeast Asia, which I want to briefly lay out for you. And up front, it goes without saying that we have a current and clear text examples of what happens when the United States of America prematurely and unceremoniously withdraws forces from areas of national significance to us. Just look at Iraq and the rise of ISIS and the threat to us today, even though it's not in the news very much. There's a good argument that our precipitous withdrawal from Iraq in 2011 created the conditions for the rise of ISIS. Look at the adventurism of Russia towards Eastern and Western Europe and understand that we drew, withdrew our last, our very last army tank from Europe two years ago, literally days before the Russians invaded Ukraine and threatened the Baltic states, Poland, and other East European NATO countries. By the way, during the Cold War, your country had 5,000 tanks in Europe. At a significant cost and a little bit late, we're now sending a few tanks back to the European continent, back to the other side of the globe. Please know, everyone, that we gain enormously from the economic interactivity of this Northeast Asia region with China, 
Japan, and South Korea. Indeed, these three countries are our second, fourth, and sixth largest trading partners on the globe. If we were to withdraw our very modest contingent of 27,000 troops from South Korea, all clear thinkers and the policy arena conclude that the region would rapidly sink into instability and clear war, of course, as a result of North Korean provocations, including the potential for that war to spread into a global conflict, and that would be because China and Russia are in the neighborhood. The histories between China, Korea, Russia, and Japan, as well as the volatile relationship between North and South Korea, almost guarantee at least a regional war should we depart. In a blink, we could lose our second, fourth, and sixth largest trading partners while being drawn into a potentially cataclysmic global conflict. It would surely make the situation in Iraq and Syria today look like child's play for the United States. Along with drawing us into a global hot war, our economy would surely crumble in that scenario. This is the World War III scenario that many people worry about. And we don't want to go down that path. And our current modest troop investment in South Korea to principally help deter the North Koreans has enormous and overlapping stability benefits for us here at home. And while the Chinese do support North Korea economically and militarily, and I will tell you they do, the Chinese see our troops in South Korea as a regionally stabilizing force. Frankly, the Chinese want us there. And they'll tell you that in a second. Don't dare go home, because we know what's going to happen if you leave. Our troops ashore in Korea, ashore in Korea, equal status quo for the Chinese. And status quo means stability for them and potential economic growth. Bottom line, China's adventurism in Northeast Asia is checked by our presence. And that's fine with them, interestingly enough. And remember that Seoul is closer to Beijing than it is to Tokyo. The Korean Peninsula is part of the Asian mainland. It's not some uh, obscure island somewhere. And it's a small neighborhood, a very, very small neighborhood. Quickly to Japan. The Japanese see American troops in South Korea as deterring North Korea and ensuring friendly relations with South Korea, all of Korea being a traditional enemy of Japan's. Looking back in history, Japan invaded all of Korea in 1910 and annexed the whole mess, made them a state, you know, a 52nd state, what do you want to call it? Korea was a state of Japan from 1910 until 1945 when the Japanese surrendered to the United States and we attempted to set up democratic government in South Korea and the, and the Japanese left. And Russia stays away. Again, this is Russia. They uh, argue about these islands, but that's the border with North Korea. Russia stays away from this area with American presidents and their fractious relations with China, which they have. The Russians know that the area today is not something that they can easily exploit. They go where weakness dominates. That's where the Russians go. And because of our presence in South Korea, that is not the situation there today. It's been in Europe where Russia has seen weakness. And that's where Russia is today pressing the Western alliance, as you see from time to time in the news. And of course, American troops ashore in South Korea fully deter the North Koreans from starting a general war on the Korean Peninsula. Trust me, fully deter the North Koreans from starting a general war on the Korean Peninsula. Last, for those who say that because of our sacrifices and long-term commitment to South Korea in the Korean War and since then, that our stationing costs, money, bucks, should be paid by them. Please understand that much of our costs are indeed paid by the Koreans to us. Today, South Korea pays America nearly $800 million a year to help defer stationing costs. They gave me a check every year I was there. Can you imagine? I mean, if I ever wanted to run away to the Antarctic, that was it. It's 800 million bucks paid to the United States Treasury, and I was the government's representative. What am I, what do I do? Dear lawyer, please come quick. Cash on the barrelhead every 
year. That's nearly 45% of our total cost to you, the American taxpayer, paid for by the South Koreans. The Germans, oh, by the way, pay us nothing, zero, for the security that we provide to Europe. Now, you might want to talk to somebody about that. So there you have it, South Korea, which I came here to talk to you about today. A modern, prosperous, freedom-loving democracy, a country with a strong and vibrant Christian tradition, a close friend of the United States of America, a dependable U.S. military ally, and a force for good in the world, a reliable and important trading partner for America. Second chart. Let me see if this, if this rascal shows up. This is a no kidding satellite picture not long ago. This is South Korea. This is the area of Seoul. That's the DMZ, demilitarized zone. And that's North Korea, vibrant at night, almost dead in the water. They got nothing. They got a military. So you have a modern, prosperous, these are just lights on at night. That's all this is, just who's turning the lights on. And as you can see, 51 million people in South Korea, smaller than the landmass of North Korea, with its 21 million people starving because of the communist policies of North Korea. Now, they say a lot in Pyongyang, but they're not going to do much to the United States of America or those in that area of the world as long as we are there. The only place, would you go back to the other chart if you could, the only place on the East Asian rim where America has troops stationed ashore on the Asian mainland. This is it. There is no other place ashore where the United States has troops deployed. Our presence in South Korea both deters China's adventurism while at the same time reassuring them in a very strange way. South Korea, the center, look at it, right there in the middle of gravity for economic prosperity and stability in any extremely dangerous Northeast Asia region. And the cost for America, total cost, after you subtract the 800 million, about $1.4 billion a year of your money goes to keeping our troops over there out of a defense budget of $585 billion. That's less than one third of 1% 1 of the defense budget. It's chicken feed at best to keep our troops over there cost-wise. And I can't even calculate how small our costs are in Korea compared to our $4 trillion total federal budget annually, except to say that we spend over $800 billion a year on direct welfare payments alone to our citizens. $1.4 billion for assured economic prosperity between the United States and Northeast Asia compared to $800 billion for welfare payments that don't seem to be helping much. Where's the better deal than the deal we have for stationing troops in South Korea? Indeed, this is a deal that even Donald Trump would be proud of once he studies it. So ladies and gentlemen, America is an exceptional country. We are. We are a global economic and military superpower. We as Americans live, work, play, and succeed in a global economy. Your livelihood, your children's livelihood, and your grandchildren's livelihoods all depend on that. And because of this, we have to have unimpeded access to important global resources, economies, and markets. And we must have friendly and reliable economic and military allies. One of the very best allies for America is little old South Korea, half of Indiana. The Republic of Korea, their real name, ROK. To ensure peace and stability in one of the most crucial trading regions on this planet, Northeast Asia, it's my sense and professional judgment that as long as our troops are welcome and wanted by the South Koreans in their land, and they are, it's in our vital national security interests and economic interests to garrison U.S. military forces there throughout this century and beyond. It is a no-brainer. In closing, I want to thank, and I'm not certain there's any of them here today, but they are in spirit, certainly here in soul. In closing, I want to thank those who served in the Korean War, 1950 to 1953, and helped generate 
uh, the underpinnings for this great country, the Republic of Korea. Their sacrifices, and indeed, your all sacrifices sent them, set the foundation for economics and, and the societal miracle that is today South Korea. In 1950, Korea was a faraway land that very few Americans had ever heard of. Today, at the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C., the inscription reads, and I will quote very quickly, quote, our nation honors her sons and daughters who answered the call to defend a country they never knew and a people they had never met, close quote. Due to our lasting, the United States' lasting commitment to the Republic of Korea, we surely know the Koreans now as one of the world's great economies and one of America's most important friends and allies. God bless those who served there in those years so many years ago, and especially those who died in the Korean War. Thank you all very much for letting me share with you a little corner of the world that's very, very important to the United States of America and very important to our deep Christian beliefs on this planet. Thank you very much.